Tuesday, June 23rd, at approximately 9 a.m. Please join me in pledging allegiance to the flag. <coughs> I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Can you share with Mr. Kent? This was good, President. Mm -hmm. Can you share it? Oh, yes. Okay, we're on. We have 21 present. Presentation of the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Correspondence. In your package, you have the unassigned fund balance, uh, three emails, one from Robert Seekers, Don Cricks, and Rick and Patty Nelson. We also received one earlier this morning, an additional one from Robert Seekers concerning the bill pod. I don't know if you received that in your email this morning or not, but we'll make it part of the correspondence. Uh, we'll move to public comment. Perfect. Because we get our technology figured out. like to do for a public comment is, again, this is the way that technology works. If you're familiar with the system, we'll actually go to the peninsula room first for any individuals who want to speak on, on items for the public comment, and then I will also make an announcement for those that are online or call the users. Again, if you're online or a call in user, there's a way to raise your hand. Um, uh, for a call in user, it's star three to raise your hand, and I can unmute you far as being able to get public comment. Just one reminder, under the public comment, we cannot take any comments in regards to broadband. Again, this way how the county operates, we actually go through a hearing process through our planning commission, or, um, and then not a planning commission, through our RPC, 
And that's where all the public comments are taken. So once it gets to the county board, it's a discussion at the county board level, but we do not take public comment. So if you do start to make comments on the broadband, I will, I guess, stop you from speaking. So with that, I will go first to the Peninsula Room. <clears throat> and the Peninsula Room right now says that it's not muted. So if someone would like to give their name and address and provide comment, please do so. Going twice in the Peninsula Room, anyone else? Oh, one second, I'll unmute you. I'll oh, try again. Wayne, if you're there, you're still muted. I had you unmuted, but it looks like you're still muted. Now we're good. How about that? Good. Now we're blue. Is there someone here that'd like to speak? You can hear us, yes, now? Yes. Okay, if you could come up closer to the mic, it would help, though, for the county board to hear you. It's a little bit better now. You want to sit there? Thank you. How's this? That's better. Okay. Um, my name is Mike Brud. I live on 2182 Sequest Road in Liberty Grove. And I'm here today to speak uh, in support of Resolution 2020-55 to conduct a countywide referendum on the creation of a nonpartisan procedure for drawing voting district maps. Um, Today I'm representing the Door County Fair Maps Task Force, a group of citizens and voters from the county. And um, I know there are other people that have submitted comments and uh, maybe would like to speak on this uh, as well online or, or here today. Um, the task force strongly supports the adoption of this resolution. Um, to date, 50 other counties in the state have passed uh, resolutions um, similar to the one the county passed in 2014, supporting the idea of nonpartisan fair maps. And subsequently, 17 counties have held referendum, all of which have passed by over 65%. Last week, Brown County Board of Supervisors approved a resolution similar to what you have before you today, and they will be holding a referendum on the issue in November. So I just wanna make two quick points. I know you've got a lot on your plate today. I want to just emphasize that, um, in our opinion, gerrymandering is the wrong thing to do, and uh, holding a referendum is the right thing to do. Uh, first, I'd like to just comment that gerrymandering, we believe, is wrong because voters should be able to select their representatives rather than have representatives select their voters. Um, I mentioned the county in action. In addition, a Marquette University Law School poll in, 19, in 2019, revealed 72% of the citizen voting citizens in Wisconsin prefer a nonpartisan procedure for drawing maps. Accordingly, our main concern is that this, the erosion of the state's democracy that is at, uh, at risk here. So we're not talking about any particular partisan issue. Mike, they're asking yes. you. Pardon? They're asking me closer to the Oh, I'm sorry. How's that? That's better. Oh, all right. I'll start over if you'd like. No, I'm kidding. No, we got part of it. Please. Uh, um, so we just want to. I just want to uh, emphasize that we believe that um, gerrymandering increases the importance of primaries, and we all know that in primaries, the extreme uh, candidates represent, representing the extreme <laughs> positions of, of either party tend to be the ones that that run, and the voters that support the extreme positions tend to be the people that vote. And the result then is you have a highly divisive uh, uh, state legislature or Congress because you end up electing extreme candidates. Um, I believe that uh, gerrymandering reduces the responsiveness of, of elected uh, members of Congress and, and legislature. Um, if they're in a safe district, they don't have to come and have town hall meetings. They don't have to listen to constituents because they know they've got their seat forever. Um, the same kind of factor would reduce the uh, interest in voters in down ballot. If you if you if you don't feel your vote counts because of the, the uh, candidate has already been selected through the primary process, then you tend to not go vote because it doesn't. Why 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 bother? Um, 
it's a subtle form of voter disenfranchisement. It uh, uh, it reduces voter turnout, like I mentioned, and uh, increases voter apathy, lack of interest, and um, just generally cre uh, is not a very positive thing for the democratic process. So why do we feel that we need to um, have a referendum? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court in 2017 and uh, uh, Whitfield, Whitford versus Gill lawsuit uh, ruled that uh, partisan uh, redistricting is not an issue that the Supreme Court can deal with. It has to be dealt with by the legislature. Well, as you guys know, in 2014, the county passed a resolution in favor of nonpartisan uh, redistricting. And so even since then, the legislature has failed to act. They need to be have more pressure put on them to, to make them... Uh, deal with this issue. Now, in the last legislative session, there were two bills introduced, one in the Senate and one in the Assembly, favoring nonpartisan redistricting. And because of the gerrymandered state Senate and state Assembly, those bills died. That's evidence right there that gerrymandering uh, is, is wrong. So uh, we feel that gerrymandering takes away the voice of the people and that by having a referendum, we give the people their voice and a chance to speak out on the issue. So with that, um, I don't know if you would do questions or if I should yield my chair to somebody else. Well, thank you for your comments. We usually do not do questions, we take comments. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and again, just for everyone that's listening to, uh, I should have made a comment before, we'll try to keep the comments uh, three minutes or less, and we'll try to do the overall public comment at 30 minutes, so. Good morning. I timed my comments out and it's two, two minutes, 57 seconds. <laughs> good, good morning. My name is Pat Zizinski, 1218 Texas Sturgeon Bay. I'm here today as a representative of the League of Women Voters to speak in support of Resolution 202055. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that educates and advocates for the rights to vote and encourages citizens to participate in the democratic process. The League has long advocated for the creation of nonpartisan redistricting, and this is regardless of which political party is in power. What happens, of course, is that whichever party is in power is reluctant to give up 10 years of political <coughs> election advantage. So in spite of lob lobbying and advocating by many citizens and groups, nothing has changed. So Mike already talked about how bills were uh, introduced in the assembly legislation to start or to change to a nonpartisan process and that the, the Wisconsin legislative leadership intentionally allows this alleg legislation to die in committee. They clearly have no incentive to change. Why would they? Regardless of the basic unfairness of this present system, the damage it does to our democratic process and even the vast majority of citizens who have told their representatives that they want change. It, as Mike said, it's literally because of gerrymandering that this state issue is being addressed. So that, that's sort of the backstory. And here is where the referendum comes in. Why would we do a referendum since it's a legislative process? What's happened when we've seen that there's no <coughs> actual legislature People from all over the state in both parties have come together in a grassroots strategy to change the democratic process by putting pressure on the legislature in the name of fairness and good governance. County by county, citizens are working with their boards, as we are doing here, to have advisory referendums regarding redistricting. As more counties pass referendums very publicly and across the whole state, the legislature will be pressured by the will of the people to finally take action. But right now, there is a window of time to get this done because new maps will be drawn following the census this year. Counties, as Mike said, have already passed referendums. Recently, Brown County passed a resolution to have an advisory referendum this fall. The League of Women Voters urges this board to offer the voters of Door County a say about redistricting in a referendum, if the Door County voters are like the rest of the state and support the creation of a nonpartisan commission to draw the legislative maps, 
It will help send an even stronger message to our legislature to finally bring this issue out of committee for discussion and vote. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in the Peninsula Room? Coming once, coming twice. Okay, I will go to the online individuals. Again, if you're online, you can actually raise your hand and I can uh, unmute you. Likewise, if you're on a phone, you can do star three and I will unmute you and you can speak. Uh, first one is Christine Reed. I have you unmuted and you have the floor. Thank you. My name is Christine Reed. I live on the Forest Hill Flowage. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, I am with Friends of the Forest Hill Dam. Yesterday, I sent an email with a link to an article in the uh, Advocate in the Press Gazette that I was going to refer to today. I'm going to touch on a few of the things in that article. Three minutes is not going to allow for enough time, so I will follow up in writing for anything that I can't cover today. Uh, the third paragraph from the article, a 2017 York County Soil and Water Conservation Analysis found the water body lacked native plant diversity. Uh, the stated goals of this drawdown of the foliage were to increase water depth, and to restore a more diverse and abundant native plant community. Then in 2016, Mary Gansberg pointed out that there was no plant survey. Aaron Hansen announced in May of 2017, quote, we will be doing an aquatic plant survey later in the summer, end quote. And then Brian Forrest reported to the LCC meeting November 16th, that the aquatic plant survey was complete. And approximately seven months later, in June of 2018, he reported to a joint LCC and facilities and parks meeting. And I'm going to read quotes from the plant, his report on the plant survey. Quote, some good stories with the vegetation. There's not nearly the vegetation density that people perceive. A lot of people think it's choked with weeds and there were only a few pockets where we really saw real dense vegetation. Um, he went on to say, quote, we didn't have much in there, but it was actually a pretty good value. If it wasn't an invasive, we had pretty good plants in there within acceptable ranges. So to use, the plant situation as justification for this drawdown doesn't add up. I'm gonna move on to the next paragraph. <clears throat> it says, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources offered recommendations for the drawdown that the county closely follows. They are simply reporting what they were told. As far as fo closely following DNR recommendations, I'm going to go back to Greg Coulter's report in August of 2016 and, and quote him. He spoke to Mary Gansberg and. Excuse me, you have 30 seconds. Draw down. Pardon me? You have 30 seconds. If, if we don't use the full 30 minutes, can I uh, make additional comment later? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. She said, and I quote, regarding the drawdown water depths, not gonna gain a lot, end quote. And regarding water quality benefits, she's, Mary Gansberg said she was unsure. If any, they would be short term because we are not removing sediments and continue to have inputs. She, she also, uh, end quote, and then uh, Greg Coulter's reported to the, that she cautioned against keeping the valve open due to invasives, end quote. Thank you, Nancy, you gotta, you're past your time, so I'll let you finish off that, that thought, but I'm gonna go to other speakers and we'll circle back. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Again, you can, if you're online, uh, again, you can raise your hand 
or if you're a call in user, you can hit star three and you can be recognized. I have not seen anyone raise their hand online or anyone hit a star three on their phone. Okay, I do have someone that did. One second. So I have a call in user. I have you unmuted. If you give your name and address, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, and good morning, everybody. Don Fricks, uh, 8305 Quarter Line Road, Fish Creek. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, I am speaking uh, to a May 12th email addressed as correspondence to the Door County Board over GOP partisan hubris. Uh, contained in a May 7th, 2020 press release from our representative, Mike Gallagher, um, and, uh, and which has been characterized as Cold War propaganda meant to demonize China and gen up xenophobia in the U.S. during the run-up to the November election. My concern for Door County was and is demonstrated local business reliance on student visa workers from China, key to seasonal business survival for many in our county. Partisan rhetoric coming from Gallagher, along with this announcement of being named to an entirely GOP China task force, is unnecessarily inflammatory and ignorantly destructive to Door County efforts to establish friendly and mutual beneficial relations undertaken through the Sister City program uh, that the county has. I'm asking Door County to immediately address Representative Gallagher on the public record through this elected body about the negative potential his statements have for Door County, and I'm assuming for much of the U.S. 8th Congressional District, similarly reliant on the tourist economy. Um, I also like to know if the email addressed as correspondence to the Door County Board from uh, my letter of May, uh, May 12th uh, was sent to all the members of the Door County Board of Supervisors, and, and I had specifically uh, uh, forward that to you, Mr. Bobick. Now, uh, part two, uh, regarding um, my correspondence in the packet today, I'm wondering if every supervisor has gotten... Hey. Hello? Yep, you're there. I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, in relation to the correspondence uh, that's printed in the information packet, if every supervisor has received a copy of the notice of claims and notice of circumstances from the uh, Friends of the Forestville Mill Pond, because that was addressed specifically to Door County Board of Supervisors. So. Uh, if they haven't, I would urge every supervisor to get a copy of the nine-page document and look at the potential damages that are being claimed. Uh, finally, um, I'm going to check in, and I'm asking the Door County Board to reconsider what I, cons uh, what I think is a prohibitive and intentional barrier to responding to open records requests with the upfront fee being assessed prior to fulfillment of an open records request. So um, I think that's unfair. I think um, it's an intentional stonewalling on the part of the county. I'm sorry that if that seems uncivil, but um, when you ask for a waiver of fees and uh, we say, oh, and there's a lot of statutory language in there that says, well, maybe you're not specific enough and maybe this and maybe that, it, it seems like boilerplate that I've received before that is intentionally squashing open records requests. So there, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak that has not spoken yet? Again, if you're online, you can raise your hand. If you're on the phone, you can hit star three and I can unmute you. Going once, going twice. Christine Reed, I'll unmute you. I'll uh, extend another three minutes. You're up the floor. Thank you. I'll pick up uh, 
where Greg Polters was reporting in August of 2016 to the LCC meeting, uh, all of the words of caution that had come from Mary Gansberg. Then he went on to say that Paul Schumacher um, had the same concerns. And he said that he also spoke to Carrie Webb from the DNR and she made, quote, very strong recommendations and quote, not to move sediment. And it is well documented that sediment, massive amounts of sediment have moved in this attempt to have a drawdown. Uh, I sent a picture this morning, it rained last night, Water level is going up approximately two inches per hour. By the end of today, it will probably see its seventh overflow of the dam. The third time that it overflowed, it overflowed for 25 days straight. More than 50% of the time, the basin of the flowage is completely covered with water. So this dry out to compact sediments it's not working. And the recommendations of the DNR, I mean, the advocate reports that the county's following the DNR recommendations because that's what they were told. However, if we go through the records, we find that they were warned not to transport sediment, not to leave the valve open for invasives, that it would not improve water quality. So the committees chose to cherry pick information, ignore those words of warning, and uh, somehow morph this into, it's going to uh, improve water depths and have a more diverse plant life. Further on in this article, uh, it says, Lino also <laughs> disagreed with claims from several friends group members who said the chairman denied meetings to further discuss their Concerns. I was amazed when I read this in the article because I stood in front of this county board on Jul in July and read from David Lino's email where he agreed to have a meeting with friends of Forceville Dam. The meeting didn't happen. I sent another email, reminded him he had shown up to many meetings and asked to be included. And uh, so in July, before the board meeting, I saw David in front of the building, and I said, in all fairness- Excuse me, you have 30 seconds. I told him that I was going to bring it up during public comment, that he had agreed to a meeting that hadn't happened. He looked me in the eye and said, and it isn't gonna. But he told the paper that denied that he did refuse to meet with us. That is absolutely unbelievable, and the statement from the health department that the same conditions exist, whether there's a drawdown or not, are totally false. They have one job to protect our health and safety, and they're not doing it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christine. Thank you. Okay, seeing that there's no other hands raised, we have completed uh, the public comment. <clears throat> thank you. Any supervisor's response? Approval of the minutes of the May 28th motion. I'm sorry, May 26th, 2020 planning board meeting. Motion to approve is written. District 15. Second. Any changes, additions? Uh, um, totally minor, but on the roll call, uh, it says three county board members are here virtually, but I missed only two, so I think it's just two. So. Dale, did you have something? No, I seconded it. Oh. I have a question on page nine of the packet, the meeting minutes at the end of the second paragraph that I'm suggesting that the administrative committee review and updates the rules of order related to agenda posting and attending. And I didn't recall any discussion on that, so I was wondering if I could ask what that was in reference to. Page nine. Page nine. Page nine of the packet. Yes, I got that. That will be coming to admin. Is this part of the 253 parks policies and procedures when we amend agendas? Okay. 
So I'll bring it forward. Oh, thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> we'll approve. Second by saying aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, we are going to, we have a couple of supervisors that are, will need to leave in a little while. So we're going to take uh, something out of order on the agenda. We're going to move the ordinance, um, which is item 12 ordinances, uh, chapter 14 tax amendments. And we're going to move that up to now on the agenda. So I will call on Mr. Hanko. Hey, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to accept the report on chapter 14 tax amendments. I'll second that. An explanation on that, or just uh, pretty self-explanatory. If you have any further questions on the report, it's not the actual motion uh, resolution. Uh, Mariah, the planning department head, is here. If you have any questions, Lauren. Yeah, I just um, told that this was the appropriate time to do this since there already was a public hearing. I just wanted to make note that there was several communications or uh, emails that I received from. People in the county and wanting to accept broadband towers, this being David Studebaker from Ellison Bay. I have to say the address too. Um, Deborah Dantoin from Sturgeon Bay. Uh, Michael Goodson uh, from Resource One Services. And Steve Jenkins that represents DC Adore County Economic Development Corporation. And also, I received phone calls. Sure, we've all received a number of phone calls and Great. emails and texts. So, um, my voice vote we will can accept the report. So, all in favor of accepting the report, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We'll move to the ordinance. David? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept and approve the ordinance 2020 07 tax amendment as proposed for Chapter 14. Mr. Chairman, I'll second that. Mr. Chairman, um, do that we have multiple uh, new members on the board and refresher for the rest of the members. I asked that our probation council get a brief uh, explanation of the typical procedures for this and the ramifications if we make changes so far. Great. Very briefly, and I'll just be quoting from the statute. It's uh, 59.69 sub 5 E 5. Uh, upon receipt of the report, uh, the county board may enact the ordinance as drafted, may amend and enact the amended ordinance, or it may deny the petition for amendment. Uh, if So there are three options. If the second option is uh, chosen or takes place, the uh, it is amended and then enacted, that triggers a 40-day review period by the town, which delays the effective date of the ordinance. So that's the sum and substance, unless somebody has some specific questions. May I inquire if, um, if there's any action the county board would take after that review process from the board, say, town, towns say they love it, they hate it, they would like to see additional changes? No, the only, uh, I guess, consequence is if a majority of the towns uh, disapprove it, then the amendment uh, would, would not take effect. Uh, but certainly the towns could refer things back, not to the county board, but to the resource planning committee. The towns themselves uh, would have the ability to uh, seek further amendment if they thought it was appropriate. And the unique thing about this particular statute is the towns can actually opt out of Chapter 14 altogether if they so choose. I hear you that. that. That answers me. I would ask that the planning department get a brief description. All right. Um. I figured what I would do first. Can everybody understand me? Can everybody with my guests? Um, 
Can everybody hear me and understand me with the mask on? Okay. I figured what I would do first, since we have a number of new county board members, is just give you some background as to regulating towers and how we got to the ordinance that we have now. And then if anybody has any specific questions about exactly what's proposed, I can answer those questions. Sorry. Um, so the county has regulated towers since at least 1995 with the adoption of the current zoning ordinance that we're under. And we may have regulated them before that. I just don't know that old ordinance. Those regulations applied in only the zoned areas that were under county jurisdiction. So it was eight of the towns and the shoreland areas of the other six. And by state statute, I just want to point out that the city and the four villages have never been subject to any of our tower regulations, just like they're not subject to any of the other county land use regulations. So they, they do their own thing. In the early 2000s, the county, instead of regulating towers under the zoning ordinance, um, a standalone ordinance was adopted regarding towers. And that was done in response to and under the authority of the 1996 Federal Telecommunications Act. It applied in all 14 towns. Um, but towers are only allowed in certain zoning districts or areas, even in the unzoned towns. Um, and under that ordinance, towers that were less than 75 feet tall were exempt from the ordinance. There were a bunch of amendments made to that um, ordinance over the time, over time, but the ones that I think would be of particular interest are those that were in 2013, which exempted wireless internet service provider towers that were under 125 feet or that were on structures as long as they were no taller than 25 feet above the building height. Then um, the state changed everything in the budget bill process in, I think, 2013. Um, so we had to rewrite our regulations because they changed how what could be regulated. So rather than having a standalone ordinance, we followed state statute and adopted an ordinance within the county zoning ordinance, and that's what's chapter 14, um, which is what is proposed to be amended before you today. Towers under that chapter are allowed in all zoning districts. Well, basically you're not allowed to prevent them in any area like you could previously. So in 2015, towers were allowed in all towns and in all areas. At the time when we were adopting the ordinance, we had gotten legal advice and engineering advice that exemptions based on height and or the type of service that was being provided on the tower were not okay um, as possible exemptions, so we didn't offer those. Then the state in 2017, or maybe it was 2016, but the county availed itself of it in 2017, established a broadband forward um, section of the state statutes. So Door County added a section to our ordinance to get broadband forward certification in place, and that was um, reviewed by the state and approved in 2017. So, like I said, this 2015 ordinance was originally in effect in all 14 towns. But as Grant said, this state law was written in a way that's not typical for land use regulations. And what it says is that towns can also adopt an ordinance if they want to. And if they do, rather than having both ordinances in place, the town ordinance only will be in place with regard to towers. That's not typical for things like land division or um, all sorts of other things, usually both ordinances would be in place. So what does that mean for Door County right now? Um, out of our 14 towns, and again, remember, the city and the villages are not subject to any of this, nor have they ever been. But out of our 14 towns, we have six towns that have adopted town-level ordinances so far. So they are not subject to the county regulations. Those towns are Bailey's Harbor, Egg Harbor, Jackson Fort, Liberty Grove, Nassawapi, and Gibraltar, although Gibraltar just adopted theirs like last week, and we don't have the paperwork yet. And so those are the six towns where these regulations aren't even going to apply. So these current amendments, um, the report in the in the in your packet actually lists exactly what is proposed, and I, again, I can answer questions on those in a minute. Uh, but where did these amendments come from? So in last fall, a number of county staff members met with representatives from Door County Economic Development Corporation at DC Broadband, and that's where these amendments stem from. Um, we are not addressing two things that they wanted, um, but everything else is addressed. The two things that they requested were that individual towers, like on, on your own property for your own use, be completely exempt, and that broadband towers essentially be completely exempt. Um, but other than that, everything that is before you today was to address complaints that had, had come to us. These amendments were reviewed by the Resource Planning Committee in January. 
And then at the time, they, the resource planning committee members decided to seek further input from the towns because they didn't want to necessarily adapt something um, without having any, any input from towns and knowing whether it would be well received. We had intended to hold a meeting in March. Um, that obviously didn't happen. <laughs> so I, I sent out three different emails to all of the towns asking them to answer specific questions based on where they were at. We had towns that had opted out that we had certain questions of them. Towns that were under the ordinance, we wanted to know whether they supported um, these amendments. And if we also wanted to know if anybody was considering opting out. So I sent that out three times. Um, and we only heard from a couple of towns. Um, we heard from the Liberty Grove Tech Committee um, via David Studebaker um, that they want broadband to be exempted. And again, you know, remember Liberty Grove is one of the towns where the rules don't apply. The Forestville Board provided tentative support for the proposal that indicated they wanted more discussion. They also indicated, that, um, I believe, but Roy can correct me if I'm wrong, that they wanted the county to continue to regulate. They weren't interested in a town ordinance. We heard from the town of Sturgeon Bay Board. They supported the amendments, possibly further amendments, um, but they didn't want to do their own town ordinance. Um, and then we heard just from two individual Sebastopol town board members. Neither of them wanted the town to regulate. One supported the amendments, um, one supported them, plus wanted to exempt broadband. And then we heard from the Gibraltar town clerk just giving us an FYI that they were going to be opting out. So those are the only towns we heard from. So that gets us to May 7th. <laughs> which is when the Resource Planning Committee um, had an agenda item to consider sponsoring the amendments that are before you that they had looked at in January. And after much discussion, they decided to sponsor them, um, feeling that it was a good faith first step and that they did not have enough information to potentially add anything else into the mix. So that's where, and then we had the meeting obviously on, on uh, June 4th, the public hearing. Um, lots of input, obviously, from people wanting broadband to be exempt. But the Resource Planning Committee chose to send to you, again, the amendments that are before you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the actual amendments. So in reference to the towns that uh, currently have their own ordinances, we didn't hear anything back from any of them at all. Just Liberty Grove. Well, uh, well, and, uh, but, well but so, I'm sorry, one of the questions that I had asked for specifically would be was if they would consider removing their own town ordinance if the county had changed theirs. We didn't hear any response back to that question. Correct. Okay. Yep. And, and just through private conversations with board members and quite a few of them, um, I was led to believe that they would. You know, and that's a private conversation between me and board members. That's not a board decision, but that they basically would keep the ordinance they have in place. Right. The only the only towns when we heard from them, the only towns that okay, wait, I'm getting mixed up. So Gibraltar is the only town that was still subject to the regulations that indicated they were opting out. We didn't hear from anybody else that wanted to opt out. And as far as it, everybody that's already out, the only town that we heard from was Liberty Grove. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, could you go through as you know briefly as you can the process of application as it applies to what's amended? Um, so basically, what is the process that as far as what is required by the state and what is required by this ordinance amendment um, as it was before and the changes that are being amended today? Because it's a pretty lengthy ordinance, so just to get an idea for that. Thank you. Okay, so um, the regulations that are in place in this ordinance, and Grant can jump in if I misspeak, but basically what we did along the way each time the state changed the statute, so with the budget bill in 2013 and with the broadband forward certification, we essentially tried to replicate what the state had in the statutes. And I, but I should point out that you don't have to adopt those statutes, nor does the state necessarily enforce them. So they just say, if you're going to regulate towers, this is what you can do. And so that's what we did. Um, as far as the actual application process, um, I mean, it, like any application that comes to our office, there are, it, it almost never happens that we get an application out of the blue. There has almost always been a meeting, a phone call, emails, multiple meetings of emails, phone calls, whatever it is, about the questions that the applicant might have. So I don't think that there's anything here that would change that at all. Um, as far as the application process itself, the, the form for applying for a tower looks very much kind of like our regular zoning permit application form is we need to know the name, the property owner, and what you're doing, a site plan. You can hand your own on graph paper if you want, we don't care. Um, 
But as far as what is in this proposal to be changed, um, the things that I think would be made easier um, are that rather than requiring, um, sorry, my mask keeps falling down, rather than requiring a, a letter of credit or a performance bond to show that there's money available for the tower to come down if it's obsolete or in disrepair, um, now we're just saying, Basically, we just need to record something at the Register of Deeds with regard to that property that basically promises that they're going to take it down when it's no longer functional or safe. Because um, we've heard that that's a big sticking point in a, in a financial obstacle. Um, I'm trying to think what else is it. Well, we, it's not any different, but we're trying to clarify or clean up the, um, the requirements with regard to the FCC and the FAA. So whether or not you're under the county ordinance, you're supposed to be complying with the FCC and FAA requirements for your towers to make sure they're not interfering with other things that are going on. Um, there are websites for both of them where you plug in the tower coordinates and height, um, and then it basically spits something back at you that tells you whether you're exempt or whether you're subject to the rules and then how to comply with the rules. Um, and like I said, that's not any different, but we did try to, to um, or simplify the, the language for those sections. The one thing that, that would be different um, is that, again, that based on the idea that um, you can't discriminate necessarily on what type of service or type of um, use, I guess, um, there's a section in the current ordinance that's under the exemptions that we've been historically um, interpreting very loosely. And it's the part where it talks about um, satellite dishes and antennas and things like that on residential properties being exempt. We've been using that to also exempt towers on residential properties, but the proposal before you recognizes that that's not actually what that language says. Um, and so moving forward, as these amendments are proposed, um, if, you're, if you were gonna be putting up a tower in your own personal property, you would need to do an application but it's only a hundred dollar fee as it has been for years. Um, and again, staff is there to assist. And, and again, we're still only, we're only talking about eight towns where it's in effect. Um, I feel like I had other things I wanted to say, but I've forgotten. Something with the setbacks, that was a shame. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, so I should say, um, while you would be required to do it, the main, the main sticking point that we hear about, other than the money things, which I think we, I think we've addressed um, with, you know, not requiring a letter of credit or performance bond or things like that, and with only having a dollar application fee. Um, the main thing that we hear with people not being able to put their towers on personal property is that they can't meet the setbacks. So what the state law used to say was that the appropriate setback was 1.1 times the height of the tower. Um, we have always had, or they have said, and so we have always had in our ordinance that if you're if you can show from the engineer of your tower that the fall down zone of that tower is less than 1.1 times the height of the tower, you can use the fall down zone. So for example, most towers are structured so that the whole thing is not going to topple over as one you know, 100 foot tall piece. They design it so that it's actually going to break off in chunks. Um, and engineers, as I've been told, um, really have that information available. And so if, if somebody can provide us a piece of paper that shows that the fall down zone for their tower, instead of being 100 feet, is 25 feet, then 25 feet is the setback we use. And that's always been true. Um, the other thing that we're doing, though, that's new in this set of proposals would be that you can, if your neighbors agree, um, you can put the tower right up to the lot line. They can wave the setback down to zero if they want to. So you, you and I should say that the state has now changed the 1.1 to one times the height of the tower. So you'll notice that in the one section that we're going from 1.1 times the height to just the height or the fall down or zero if your neighbors want to wait the step back. Joel? Can you hear me? I guess I got a couple comments and then ultimately a question to ask. Um, firstly, I've gotten more phone calls in the last two weeks than I had in 12 years on this matter. So obviously people are concerned and have questions about this specifically from up in the northern door area. Um, Regarding what you just said, it is obvious to me, and I think that there's just a big miscommunication, maybe disconnect in what was currently in place or lack thereof or misconception from the public. Because I didn't understand this that you just mentioned it, but Liberty Grove is the example I will use is since they have now passed, are they exempt from this is what you said because they have their own ordinance? Correct. 
So, and they have been for four years. Okay, then that, that right there is telling me that there's a disconnect on regulations and rules because if that was the case, why are people from the Liberty Grove Town Hall Technical community and their town board calling and asking to exempt this if they're not even being affected by it? So there's a communication fault to begin with there, I guess, on understanding. But also, if, Libera, if any township falls under county zoning ordinances, how can the town have something in effect that they don't have no say over because they fall under county zoning? So I'm confused on that point as well. But please answer the first one regarding if they're not affected, why does this matter to them? There's something they're not understanding, obviously, or myself. Sure, can I give context to that one? Because I've been, so this ordinance was really adopted just when I started. And then actually since then, I've been working on this with different stakeholders and different groups all the way through. The big issue, if you talk with most of the towns, is that they do not have any interest on regulating the large towers, the cellular towers mainly because of the technical requirements to review those. So if you had told the towns, they would, almost all of them, again, anecdotally, but with my working group, they have been lobbying to say that we prefer to be under the county ordinance because we have the expertise and where we'll be able to regulate those large structures. However, that being said, they are not interested in us in regulating what's considered the broadband towers. So that's why even like Liberty Grove, they've been very active because they would prefer to have one consistent ordinance across the board for the entire county for that aspect of it, but they do not want to have the broadband included. That'd be the best answer I can give. And I understand that as a follow-up. Um, so yes or no, can an individual in Liberty Grove right now construct a 75 foot basically TV sized tower on their property to connect to a wireless broadband network for internet. Yes. Do they have the ability to do that? Right now under the current rules, regulations, zoning, county or local. Yes. Can they do that? The, the only the only stipulations are and Vivian had asked this before and I forgot to answer it. Um and you can't be closer than 75 feet to the ordinary high water mark because the, the state shoreland regulations trump these in the towns. Um, nor can you put one in a wetland, even if you're even if you're not under county zoning or you have your own ordinance. Okay, that I understand. Um, we're not going to beat that the state, obviously. So you answered my question. So then I go back to my first point: is they're only bitter now because they feel that they can't do this when the reality that they can, or they're just looking to get rid of it altogether and not treat small towers like the ordinance is treating bigger cellular towers. I think it, it, that's the one argument that we've heard is that they feel like they're, the, I have to be careful how I say this because there are other companies that are doing broadband. Um, some of the towers are of a much, let's say, um, lighter construction. Um, so they, they're not you know, as big of a thing that you might worry about having to fall on your property. But I think Ken is, is right. Um, or I guess I should say, I, I, I think, I'm sure Ken is right, but I, that's the first that I had heard that that's why some of these towns were still so interested in the matter, because they hadn't talked to us about that. And I had thought, but I, I'd have to look up that I had thought in Mr. Studebaker's letter to the Resource Planning Committee that he had indicated that they would not come back under the county code, but maybe that was because of the broadband issue, no matter what we did. I don't know. Um, I will say, too, that, um, and Grant, I talked about this a little bit, um, it doesn't matter, it honestly doesn't matter to our department as a regulatory agency whether all 14 towns opt out. It really doesn't matter. We just need to know where we're regulating what. I just wanted to provide context as to how we got to where we are. Grant and I have talked about that even if all 14 towns were to adopt out, that there might still be some sense in having the county have an ordinance on the books that's there in case a town decides to opt back in or is found to have an ordinance that was not adopted correctly or whatever the case may be. There is also the fact that um, we do have, even though the broadband realm doesn't think that it's doing what it's supposed to in this county, we at least have the state certification for the broadband forward program. So wonder if that matters, if the county were to try and do a project where grant money might be out there, I think that makes us look better that we have, you know, we have this ordinance and we've got this certification. But again, you know, maybe, maybe that's meaningless if all 14 towns opt out. I don't know. Todd? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Blake like Joel, um, certainly a lot of um, conversation in the past couple of weeks regarding this issue. And, and um, I personally tried to educate myself in talking to a number of veterans and, and some of the 
ARPC committee here as to what the hot buttons were behind all this. And it's pretty obvious that um, this ordinance itself can be rather complicated. And as we regulate towers around the county, um, there's a lot of maybe unintended consequences. So my comments um, are not necessarily toward um, having the Wild West and towers wherever we want. I want to really understand that because I happen to live under some pretty large scale towers in Southern Dirt County that I'm not absolutely fond of. But, um, <coughs> Loud and clear, um, regardless of who brought this issue in front of the county in December pre-COVID, um, our stakeholders have gotten behind the fact that the county seems to be standing in the way of broadband access throughout the county. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't think um, we can probably debate that here all day, whether or not um, some sort of exemption for broadband towers would make everyone miraculously excited about their broadband. I, I'm certainly not here to say that. I doubt that that'll be the case, as I spoke to, to many folks. But loud and clear, our stakeholders and many, many, many county residents are saying, county, get out of the way. Um, and and whether folks can afford what, what it is um, that broadband would bring or not, I don't know that we're necessarily here to judge that. But I think there's been a pretty strong public outcry to this. And again, very much um, heightened um, as, as large businesses and people began working from home over the past couple of months, it became very obvious. And to me, most importantly, um, I think every school up and down the peninsula is saying, you gotta do something, you gotta do something. So if this is something, I guess, so be it. I personally would like to see a very simple exemption to broadband powers be put into the ordinance. And I know that is probably to the defiance of many or a few, but uh, I know there's strong personalities on both sides, but I think any sh anything short of that um, is going to be viewed as uh, restrictive enough to uh, not allow broadband where it belongs. My comments. Thank you, Todd. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for Mariah, maybe, maybe for uh, Grant, uh, towers last a long time, and you you stated that there would be a requirement that the owner would have have to have recorded with Register of Deeds to remove the tower if it's obsolete. So right now, do you want me to answer that now, or did you want to continue? Well, I, I was going to continue and say because they last a long time. If the property is sold. Is the new owner going to be under that same restriction if it's recorded at Register of Deeds that they would have, if the tower just, if they have years go by and it's obsolete, that they must remove it? Well, I'll let Grant jump, jump in a minute. Right now, what is required is that there be a letter of credit or performance bond to guarantee that the tower is going to be removed. If what we're suggesting with the amendments is that instead of one of those options, which are apparently rather expensive, that basically you would record something with Register of Deeds promising to do so. And my guess is that I'll let Grant answer that it would run with the land, not the current owner. That, that is correct. Uh, with this amendment, there are two options available for restoration at the end of the useful life of the tower. One would be the traditional financial assurance that has been in this ordinance uh, for a significant period of time. And what's being added by amendment is a restoration agreement that would be recorded. And that would impose a duty on the owner of the property uh, to remove the uh, tower at the end of its useful life. And that runs with the land irrespective of who the owner is. So. Yeah. That makes sense if it's with the land and not the owner because the owner can change. It could be sold several times. And then eventually the tower will be obsolete and have to be removed. So if it's if it's attached to the land, then then I guess that answers my question. It would be covered. Thank you, Biz. Thank you. Thank you. I have two questions. One is Mariah, if you could clarify, we're, we're commonly in the room. Well, first of all, I guess I want to say that I agree that we should expand our internet access. And many of the comments that I've gotten in this process have been aimed at the county playing a big role in that. And I think we could play a big role in that through future grant applications and through future efforts as a county as we see fit through all, all various departments. But I don't, I see the amendments we're proposing today as really addressing some of the main concerns as well as still offering some of the opportunity in the ordinance for the common good of neighbors. I really like the setback agreement of neighbors agreeing on a setback. 
So you don't put neighbors against each other by just not having any regulation of it at all. Um, so those are some of the benefits that I see. And then what I was getting to before is with the towers and the broadband, we commonly in this room have been using broadband towers. Can we define them that way? Because my understanding of broadband tower, it could be 200 feet, it could be 75 feet. So are we talking about the type of power or the height of the tower um, as we're looking at this? So Option. one thing that I forgot to point out, um, <laughs> I'm sure you've all read it closely based on your questions and all the inputs have gotten. Um, in the new proposed amendment language, you'll see that there is just a general exemption being proposed for support structures that are 50 feet or less in height, and I'll explain why we picked that number. Um, that it has to do with the sections immediately subsequent to that because the state made yet again new changes last year, this time with regard to what the state calls small wireless facilities. Um, and those have to do with whether they can go in a right of way or not. And we're, we're deciding just to exempt those. But as part of those new state regulations, they hit 50 feet for the height for those small wireless facilities as the height generally at which those are going to be exempt. So that's why we picked 50 feet or less. But as far as um, your, your question, it just flew out of my head. I'm sorry. <laughs> the use of the, the word broadcast yes, versus okay. yes. wireless. And right. I guess it's just a technical question that I'm trying to understand right. better as well. And we actually had quite a bit of discussion about that, at, as you know, at the Resource Planning Committee meeting, at what is broadband and what is a broadband tower, because it's not always the same. So, um, all right, I mean, the definitions and what people think of aren't always the same. So there are some companies that provide broadband services only on a particular type of tower. There are other companies that provide broadband with what are their services. So, for example, resource planning committee members might remember that in this past year, um, AT&T put up a tower in the town of Claybanks, which included broadband service as well as their cellular phone service. And I think that one was over 200 feet tall, but I'm not positive about that. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a, a mixture. So that, I guess... I don't know if this is your point or not, but again, we don't care what you tell us to regulate. So you can adopt whatever you want to, but we want to know exactly what it is that you mean when you adopt it. So if you're going to exempt something that hasn't been proposed, then I want to, I just want to make sure that we understand exactly what the rule is so that the zoning administrators can explain it to people and administer it. And just part of that, does that how does that um, fit together with co-location? So if you exempt, if like someone is saying you exempt a broadband towers, then can you co-locate other things on that? Because you've only exempted a broadband tower by name. I think Grant might want to chime in on whether you can exempt something that's just for a particular type of service or, or um, offers preference to a particular type of service. But one thing that I want to mention is that under the, I think it was the early 2000s ordinance, um, at that time, when we took the tower regulations out of the zoning ordinance and put it in a standalone ordinance, um, we required that all towers going up that were subject to the ordinance allow for up to three or four co-locations of other companies or other types of services or whatever, other equipment on there. Um, that is now not allowed under the state statute. You cannot require that towers be constructed such that other services can be co-located on them. But I'm going to let Grant answer the question about whether... Oh. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Essentially, and we've talked about this over the years as the various uh, iterations of the draft that's now before you has come forward. Uh, from a legal perspective, it would... The better practice would be if we were inclined to exempt towers, would be to exempt towers based on their height and other dimensions versus favoring or discriminating against a particular type of technology. Uh, I certainly understand that in general, broadband services uh, equipment is smaller than some others, but uh, we don't want to run afoul of the uh, FCC's. Uh, prohibition on, again, either favoring or disadvantaging a particular type of service. And that, and that can be done legally. So uh, again, if we're going to exempt like we've done in this amendment, we simply exempted uh, towers that are 50 foot or less in height. And it doesn't matter what you put on them, if 50 foot or less in height, they're exempt. Uh, and if we were inclined to exempt something uh, other than I, I just would suggest strongly that it be based on the height of the tower and the dimensions at the base, because that's sort of what we've seen in doing our research. Uh, and those numbers are available. We just don't have them in front of us. And 
Right. And again, that 50 foot number, the reason that that was put forth is because that matches what the state has apparently decided is okay for those small wireless facilities. Um, again, going back to that ordinance that we adopted in the early 2000s, which got superseded in 2015, 75 feet is what we used to exempt. So it used to be that if you're 75 feet or less, we didn't care what you were doing or where you were. David? Okay. Um, Grant got to the last part of one of my first questions, which was um, we have historically been basically told we cannot exempt a type of service in any of our ordinances. We basically have to generically treat them. So a reminder that uh, what we are not really talking about is wireless broadband. Because broadband is available in this county, throughout this county, in a variety of ways besides these little towers or any same kind of towers. Um, DSL is broadband. Um, if we made some kind of a proposal to exempt some kind of tower beyond what this ordinance is written, keep in mind that 5G is coming. 5G is going to require even closer towers than we currently see with the 4G. And that is broadband as well. So if you make some kind of an ordinance related to that, it's going to apply to them as well, cellular towers. Um, if we made an ordinance, if, we, if there was a proposal during today's discussion, to exempt something else. I know there's been discussion and I've heard about it as well, um, about exempting broadband towers. Um, would we effectively be less restrictive then than the existing ordinances the individual towns have? Because basically if we exempted <coughs> them, there'd be zero paperwork required, correct? No fees, no nothing. Um, I think so. I, the town ordinances that we have copies of are very brief. They do kind of refer to the statutes, um, but I don't really know what pieces of the statutes they're enforcing. I think most of them are requiring it that tower installers get um, a town level building permit from the building inspector, and I think the fees are about $100 for those. Okay, so effectively, if, we, if a proposal came through from this body of an, an amendment that were required to allow for an exemption, we would become less expensive, less restrictive, simply because of the fee. If that's all it was. And if they didn't need an application, then yes, they assume. Okay. Um, a reminder that we are really talking about wireless internet service here. We are not talking about broadband in general, because broadband is cable to broadband, is DSL, broadband is uh, satellite. Um, those services are all available to the majority of individuals in this county as it is. Um, uh, Ken, you have made the comment that you've been working with other groups on this topic for the last several years. Correct. Um, forgive me, but I don't remember anything coming before the RPC about that. Very hard public hearing on that? No, I've been following it all through both Grant and Roy. So you know, I was at the meeting at the last one that I was going to report on all the work that's been done, but that writing one took a lot more time, a lot more time than I could stay. So, because that was one of my concerns during this entire process, um, was imperial data, actual proof of the complaints that were brought to us. You know, um, give us examples of where this expense was going to be. I, I can't picture it, I need help to understand that. Um, as the director said, the majority of Northern Door, other than Washington Island, um, either will have or does have a, an ordinance that overrides all of this. Um, I, I'm not in favor of exempting a set simply because of outcry that it should be exempted. Um, we also need to remember we're, we're considering neighboring property rights. Um, it's not just a matter of what this, this group of individuals would like to see. It's me sitting next door, me being five miles away, two miles away from this project, whatever that might be. That affects my rights as well. Um, I'm not saying personally, but the neighboring property right next door. One of the reasons why we had the setback originally, and now we have the exemption allowing for the neighboring property to sign off on that change, which to me is a sensible choice given, given those options. Um, and again, any exception that we do, this would apply to just for every vendor out there, not just the recognized outcry right now of broadband, wireless um, services in this county. Do you, I, I'm going to be putting you on the spot because I know you don't have an answer for this really, but I want to make you answer it. Um, 
of the count towns that have exempt have their own ordinances. How many towers have gone up in there? Are you aware of any quantity? Are you asking me right. or Ken? I, I think Ken might actually be better feel right. for that, but I, I know that um, in David Stubaker's letter that he wrote to the Resource Planning Committee, the town has worked with DC Broadband to install some towers at town properties, and they've got plans in the works to do a couple more. I don't know how many that is, and I don't know how many individual individually owned towers may have gone up. That is, just so everybody knows, that's one of the very specific pieces of information that the Resource Planning Committee wanted and that I asked for from the towns that had exempted themselves was, can you please give us examples of what has happened in the last handful of years so that we understand whether or not what you're doing really was precluded by our ordinance and we didn't get information back other than from David and because um, was not very specific for us to be able to say, okay, yeah, they're right, they couldn't have met that setback or whatever. Because we've had at least four years of examples of where our importance doesn't even apply. So there should be some data available over those four years that we weren't able to get in. I didn't get anything back. Um, Nassau Abbey and Liberty Grove they exempted themselves relatively quickly. There were some that snafus with Liberty Grove not actually filing the correct paperwork until last year, but we weren't enforcing our ordinance in that town in the last couple of years because we knew that they thought they had exempted themselves. Um, Jackson Board also exempted itself about three years ago. Bailey's Harbor and Egg Harbor, I think it's been, Egg Harbor might only be about a year. Bailey's Harbor, I think it's been two, maybe that they've exempted themselves. And then, like I said, Gibraltar was just this past week or so. Ken, did you, might you have information on those tower installations in those other areas or something that you had out of your work group? Well, I know the town of Gibraltar, as Maria said, I know that I think two or three that they're working on as far as on town properties. And I know the biggest one was just the applications that they put in for the broadband for the last uh, set of proposals. But a lot of those were partially dependent on eventually getting the amendments uh, amended. For what those were those ones where we co sponsored? Uh, yeah, we were co sponsored. Yeah, I think there were only three of the eight were awarded. So. So. And, and right now, our ordinance is broadband certified, correct? Correct. And I, I made sure because when the ordinance got adopted, we had a very similar meeting to this and a very similar hearing to this. Um, when we applied to the state for that broadband forward certification, I specifically asked the Public Service Commission to look at our entire chapter just to make sure that we weren't doing anything that they felt was untoward um, and they didn't have any negative comments about any of it. Again, I know that doesn't necessarily mean that it's working locally, but we're just we're, we're not doing anything that is precluded or considered negative. And I, I've got probably one last question then, a comparable. They use this at the RPC meeting. Um, People need zoning permits for fences. I'm not fences, I'm sorry, we don't have that here, but for decks, accessory structures, and so forth, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, they have setbacks for those structures as well, right? Yes. On property lines. Um, we want to. I mean, a much lesser setback than a tower would be. But what? again, depending on, I said a much lesser setback than a tower would be depending on the fall zone or the neighbors. Right. And that's comparable the to the, if, say, the neighbor allowed it to be closer. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, it's not allowed to be on the property line at all, right? Without a variance, no. And a variance would be due to some strange condition of some sort, right? Yeah, usually it's got to be something related to the that they just can't comply with the property or with the permit because of something about the property. Thank you. Uh, before I go on to the next four or five people I'd like to talk, I would like to speak since I don't have a way to push a button here. <laughs> okay. um, I think we're broadening the discussion way beyond where it needs to be. I think we need to come back to what does Door County need to do to satisfy people's urge and need to try and get some broadband. I agree that the RPC has put a lot of work into this. I think what they've come up with is, is good. I think we need to pass the ordinance that they have with all the changes, but I would like to make an amendment in one little section. If you look on page, the very first page, mobile tower siting, Get on number four exemptions. There's A, B, C. On the next page, you have a D and an E. And E is exempt support structures of 50 feet or less in height. I would like to make an amendment. My motion to the amend is this. Um, motion to amend the proposed ordinance specifically revise 14.01 mobile tower siting. Paragraph four, exemption E, to read as follows. 
support structures with an overall height of 120 feet or less with an area at the base not greater than nine square feet if guide, guide wires, or 36 square feet if freestanding and used, i.e. access supports equipment and components including the antennas necessary to provide wireless broadband service. Second. I did take this, I had this discussion with both Ken and Grant. Ryan was, was part of it, that was me. Um, Grant uh, is the one with Ken who wrote the amendment. So it would match and fit uh, what we're looking, what we're trying to do. That would be my motion to amend. Mr. Chairman, I ask just for clarification quick. You said uh, guide nine square feet and freestanding. 30 some square feet. If it's not guiding, it's it, not guiding, it needs a wider base. Okay. Thank you. And those square footages are based on things within the task force history of what broadband towers typically need. That's much less than you would ever use for a cell tower or anything else. It keeps it very small, very specific. But I believe it would meet the needs that everybody's asking for. So would somebody please second? Or just second. Or second. Can I ask a question? Yes. Wait, where'd that come from? Me. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. Uh, I just want to make sure I understand this. So rather than exempting all structures that are 50 feet or less, regardless of type of service, the proposal is just for broadband. Uh, that, that would be an addition to the... Okay, so you're not getting rid of that language. No, you're adding to the sentence to after it. Okay. May I ask a question real quick for clarification? Well, I'm fine. I need for a moment to talk. Laura? Yes, I, um, I wanted to clarify, ask some questions for Mariah. So at the beginning of your um, um, explanation of Chapter 14, you said that there's 14 towns and that seven already have opted out of this ordinance or countywide. So could you clarify that on the statement you made really early this on? This gets to what Joel was confused about, too. The way this statute was written was very confusing because normally what they'll do is they'll say, okay, counties, cities, towns, villages, if you're going to regulate topic X, this is what you get to do, and you can all adopt an ordinance. In counties, where we have jurisdiction, it's usually towns. So if usually the county and the town adopt an ordinance, they're both in effect. For towers, what they did was, what the state did was say, if the town adopts a tower ordinance, then if the county has an ordinance, that county tower ordinance is not in effect in their town at all. So it's confusing because if you think about zoning, county zoning, county comprehensive zoning, we have jurisdiction in nine towns, and then there are five that we do not have jurisdiction. That does not match this list because of the way the state statute is written. So some of the towns that have opted out of the tower chapter are actually in county zoning still. Right, gotcha. So then with that being said, um, and that was this, you said then with your reply that one wanted to opt out if you re request some feedback with what was being proposed today. And then you said two of them wanted more amendments. Could you specify what those other two wanted for more amendments? They were not specific. So the, when we put forth these amendments in January and put them out to the towns to ask for comments, we heard from the Liberty Grove Tech Committee who wanted to exempt broadband, and that was via David Studebaker. We heard from the Forestville Board that supported what was being proposed and wanted more discussion about further amendments. We heard from the Town of Sturgeon Bay Board that supported the amendments, possibly further changes, um, and indicated that they didn't want a town ordinance. And then we heard um, from two Sebastopol board members, but not the board officially, that one of them supported the amendments, one supported exempting broadband. Okay, so did you ask them this? Did you reply back to ask them to specify what those other or more amendments? I had already were? asked everybody three times. To oh, and they just no, said, <laughs> maybe they didn't know. And then, okay, so thank you. Like, I didn't know if you were. Um, and then also for the public hearing notice on this amendment, I just wanted to give you some feedback. I received some complaints that people that normally were part of the email process to get notifications of any public hearing, for only they didn't receive, they didn't see it, receive it. So they were a little upset about that. And obviously public hearing is closed. I, don't should, so should, that's all. I need to remind you right now, I should be debating the amendment. Yeah. And so I, then also, I just wanted to also speak to that. Um, from information that I received is that the timeline by making this amendment that's proposed 
uh, for the motion is that it would decrease it by three, about three months. And that was, it's not so much the permitting process, but potentially by exempting those towers from coming to the county or RPC that saves or shaves off about two to three months of a project that somebody would have. Towers don't go to the resource planning committee, they're just processed by staff. Okay, so they never come to a public hearing at RPC? Only in the town of Claybanks, and that's due to state statute for exclusive agricultural zoning. They're just processed by staff over the counter. Okay. So, in the staff so one still does. Okay, thank you. Oh. Alexa. Thank you. Um, I had a comment before, a question, and I don't know if it fits now, so I can ask later. But I was going to ask about the PSC grants, and then it got brought up that three of the eight which were submitted got awarded. And I'm just wondering, is there any feedback on why those got denied, or is it part of our ordinance that was an issue? No, the PSC was just competitive, so there was, I think, $48 million divided over the biennium, so it was $24 million, and they had requests of over $52 million, so this is a matter of priorities and how they scored out. Correct. It wasn't any feedback on our ordinance or issues. Correct. Thank you. Susan? Um, to answer another thing to Alexis about this, I was involved in supporting both the Nassawapi grant and the Thomas Sturgeon Bay grant. And they had both applied previously. So they, I don't know if it matters if you have had multiple applications for similar things, but that may have had a, a role in. And one of them is for a cable type of broadband, not, or whatever we call this, but not towers. So what I really wanted to say though is, being on the RPC is a really tough assignment um, I served on the RPC for six years, but not in the in the two recent terms. And I know the amount of time that they put into this. And I truly believe that if there is a committee that does their due diligence and and discusses and discusses and labors over the right thing to do, I truly believe this is a committee that does. I agree, however, with what Todd said, and I thought he said did a very good job with it, which is. There is a perception that's out there that we are in the way. And um, the work group that Ken talked about, you know, there are bigger issues they could be talking about. Like, I, I really don't think that a tower here and a tower there is going to solve this for this community, for the county. So there are bigger things they got to look at. And right now, all of the energy is being devoted to this one issue. And so I, I support this amendment. I think we have to get out of the way, clear the deck, you know, get off the dime, whatever metaphor you want. We need to get out of it and, and deal with this, um, have this amendment, and then maybe that work group can go back to looking at a bigger picture. Before I go to Vinny or Dave, I'm going to go to Bob. He's had a chance to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had a question um, uh, about the amendment as far as the height. Is, the, is 120 feet a magic number versus 100 or 80? I just was curious if that had anything to do with, with, with technical information from, from tower people. What, what, why is 120 feet the proposed amendment? Thank you. 120 feet came from uh, just talks with the different working groups, and it really has to do with the tr average tree height and tree canopies. Usually 120 feet gets you above the tree canopy. Thank you. For the species of trees that are found. David? Uh, as far as the one, uh, 125 feet, another note is RPC looked at that. We had a wide variety of input from the broadband community, wireless broadband community at that time, and changed it for the same reason is, is that was a more, for, more typical functional height for them. Tower sections come in 20 foot sections, 20 and a half foot sections. Um, um, clarification on the guided tower part of the amendment. It is a nine square foot base, right? For the guided tower? Correct. Guided. As written. What was the writing on that? 36 square feet of freestanding, nine square feet of guide. Okay, where's the nine square feet measured? I mean, is it anywhere on the property or what are we talking about? The reason I ask is because. It's base of the tower. Okay, the reason I ask is guided obviously means it's got a base somewhere. Um, I've, I've installed towers. They have anywhere between three to four um, anchor points for guided wires, which are usually one third the height of the tower away. 100 foot tower means it's 33 feet away. Um, 
we're not counting that in the square footage either. Okay, because that, that by the way, when we, we talked about this years ago, when we looked at different exemptions for the same reason with input from the then wireless broadband entity, we kind of tried to come up with a square footage as well to mitigate other certain types of towers that are capable of doing that. Um, so just want to keep in mind that any tower that with this ordinance adjustment that includes a base point roughly one third the distance away times three or times four um, uh, on the property as well. Um, and again, this would apply to every style. You know, 5G when it gets here, we'll be using those towers as well. That's it. Thank you. Any? Um, I guess just I want to clarify what Dave. Um, you're, so you're saying that any towers that actually don't meet this exemption guideline would go back to the normal process that we have in the chapter. So if their base is bigger than nine feet guided or 36 feet freestanding, then they would apply for a permit as they do now. Thank you, David. Yes, uh, I'd like to comment that I agree with what Todd had said earlier in his uh, presentation and what Susan has said now. I support this amendment. I think the people of Southern Door are having problems getting the internet connection available throughout the county. We talked to one person, can't do anything there. They go to Grandpa's house, and then they are not able to increase their reception. Uh, the kids, School, college kids working from home, from class, other adults working at home, and maybe make sense if you don't have any uh, villages and so forth that there's less location. So, we definitely need to help. Okay, thank you. Okay, we will go to vote on the amendments. Pass on the vote of 20 yes and one abstention. Thank you. So now, um, oh, dang, I'm sorry, read it. Sorry, read it. Abstention. Sorry, Dave. So that's passed 20 yes, one day. Thank you. Okay, so now we will move to vote on the amended ordinance. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Yeah. I hit my request to speak and I never had a chance to speak. Oh, it didn't come up. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I sat through all this. I'm certainly not an expert on any of it. But, Grant, I know I asked you specifically at our last meeting when we voted to pass this, if I understood it correctly. And my point was, this is strictly a tower ordinance, strictly tower. It has nothing to do with the use of that tower. And we cannot, if I remember correctly, we cannot make exceptions for the various users because if we do that, we're playing favorites and we can't get into that. And, and I think you alluded to that earlier. But I just want to, am I correct on that? We can't say uh, you can have a tower if you use it for for broadband, but you have to be restricted if you use it for something else. You're absolutely correct. But with the amendment, and it's a subtle distinction, and I was going to explain it, it's not limited to broadband services. What it says is it must include broadband services. So under the broadband forward statute, in my opinion, we're able to incentivize broadband services by uh, allowing a, exempting a tower that has broadband. We're not limiting it. It's the broadband. It can have whatever other services you want. Right. Uh, but it's it's, a, it's akin to requiring uh, co-location. And, and I think it's safe to say that there's probably not too many towers, towers go up that don't have some sort of serve some purpose for this broadband, so I'm comfortable with it. 
Okay. But, but you're actually correct, and I'm quite glad you brought it up because th this is a distinction with a difference. So. David, um, my final comment on this thing. This has been interesting uh, uh, as a topic. Uh, it's been interesting to watch the general public. I wish there were things that the general public would actually make a more stronger effort equivalent to actually participating in this. The thing that I find ironic is that if the towers, I don't personally read the ordinance as was it was written or as it is written today, is really a hindrance to business. Um, the amendment to me is not necessary for that issue either. Um, the reality for me is that just because you have changed an ordinance, um, and for the amendment, I would be voting against the it as presented. Uh, if it was not the amendment, I would have voted for it. Um, back when my children were in school, I could not have afforded the service. So it's a moot point if you put the towers up, I could not have afforded it. And that's a far bigger variety of the people in this county. Then there are people that are arguing for this service to exist because just because you lo loosen the re regulations from selling a product does not mean the customer does not show up. And it's it's interesting. And we have our PC, uh, Susie was correct. I, every year I've sat on there, I've been really quite impressed with the variety of individuals on that board at different times and how contentious the topic can be and how clearly partisan orientated a topic can be that we can sit down and create something that actually we get compliments from individuals that have even failed, the people that have been against it, that, that we're all for a, a variance request, that the variance request went down, not variance, I should say conditional use. And we've got the applicants come to us and thank us for truly looking, acting, and feeling like independent individuals working on the correctness of this issue. Uh, for me, it's difficult to watch an exception made that will actually bring other issues into it and not resolve the issue already as perceived as existing. If you can afford a seven to $12,000 dollar, how are you to put it off? Okay, we need to bring this discussion to a close and get to a vote. I already voted on the amendment. Did you have a brief comment? <clears throat> yes, just to, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, to comment or a question for Grant. <clears throat> because of the height of this that we're talking about, uh, people that live close to Cherryland or Ephraim Airport or the airport on Washington Island, they, they could still be affected by their height? I'm not quite sure uh, I understand the question. I'll try to answer it. The FAA becomes involved, in it, as I understand it, at 199 feet. No, actually, you need to check with them. Right. There are people, yeah, because there have been some towers that have not been able to go up in Gibraltar at the height that the people wanted them because of their proximity to the airport. I guess what, what's important, and, and, I, and I think I understand your question, is just us exempting these types of towers or support structures from our ordinance does not relieve them of complying with the other applicable federal state regulations that Mariah talked about, including the FAA. It's just they're not subject to our ordinance. You're still going to have to check with the FAA and the Wisconsin Bureau of Aeronautics to make sure they can put the tower that's proposed up where they want to put it if it's within that. I think it's quite path. Yeah, there's a, there's a there's path a that, for you, and then you can go on the FAA um, website and plug in the tower coordinates and the proposed height, and then it tells you whether or not you're going to have an issue or whether there's regulations that are going to come into play. And then just remember one thing, that even if you're exempt from our ordinance, um, you're not exempt from checking with the county to make sure that your tower is not in the lines of sight for county critical communication towers. I'm not sure that always happens, but it, that is the way that it's written, that they're supposed to also still be calling us. Thank you. Okay. I've already called for the question. We're going to go to the vote. Okay. Let's pass on the vote at 20 yes, one nay. Thank you. Dan? Did you say that some supervisor were not going to make the full meeting? Yes. Um, does re uh, resolution 52 require a supermajority? Okay, we're going to take a 10 minute break and we'll come back. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay.